Funny, right? Yeah, it's an oldie but a goodie from SNL. Interesting concept though, isn't it? Don't buy what you can't afford. It seems very simple. It makes total sense. It's so obvious that they made a sketch out of it on Saturday Night Live. The idea of buying what you can afford should probably be the basis for everybody's financial plan. And it, it likely would be if the whole concept wasn't so un-American. We live in a culture that tells us that immediate gratification and satisfaction should reign supreme. If you want it now, you should get it now. I mean, just get a credit card or another credit card or take out a loan, whatever means it takes. But don't wait till you can afford it. I mean, who knows when that might be? That's crazy. You should enjoy it right now. And that's probably why so many Americans are in debt and worry about money all the time. According to debt.org, more than 189 million Americans have credit card debt. Typical American households carry an average debt of over $137,000, and that's up from around $50,000 in the year 2000. Tim told us some stats last week as well. According to a recent survey from mobile banking company Vero Money, they polled more than 1,000 U.S. adults and found that a full 30% say they are constantly, not sometimes, not once in a while, but they are constantly worried about their finances, stressed out about money. Other studies have made similar points. Less than half of Americans have enough to cover a $1,000 emergency. $1,000, that means that half of the American population is one bad incident or catastrophe away from maybe being penniless. Those aged between 18 and 24 had less than $1,000 in their saving, savings account, period, and nearly half of them have nothing saved at all. Do you realize 18 to 24, these are the kids that are in college, many of them racking up lots of debt, and they have no savings at all. Nearly 70% report that they've dipped into their savings at least once in the past two years to make it to the next payday. And of millennials, 19% of respondents say they're living paycheck to paycheck. It's not so funny anymore. And I would imagine that many of us at Grace would fall into some of these same statistics. That grim picture is true of many of us in this room and many of you watching online. We're kind of a mess, a lot of us, when it comes to our financial situation. And our unhealthy money habits are causing tremendous stress and tension, which then causes unhealth in all areas of our lives, emotionally, mentally, relationally, and even physically. In every article or anybody that you hear speak about marriage, Money is always one of the top two issues that married couples argue about all the time. Many of that leading to divorce. I see a correlation between our issues with money and the divorce rate in this country. So a lot of us are in somewhat of a financial mess. And at Grace, what we want for all of you, for all of us, is that you're living the best life possible, that you're living the good life. We want you and your family and your friends to have the richest, fullest, deepest life that is possible. And that's why this month, we're kicking off the first of many sermon series focused on the good life. And as we return to this series over the course of time, we're going to look at all sorts of things like how to navigate technology in the world that we live in today, how to communicate better with each other, among other topics. But this month, we're starting with how to live the good life financially. And not only are we going to be talking about it in services, but we have all sorts of resources that we'll be offering beyond the weekend that you can take advantage of. What we're offering 
through this series is the most complete, comprehensive, holistic approach to finances in our church's history. And it's all free of charge for any of you that want to take advantage of it. And all the material is based on the well-known Christian financial expert, Ron Blue's curriculum, God Owns It All. And I'll share more about these additional opportunities in a bit. But I want to make sure you understand this is not a series on giving. Although giving is a part of a healthy view of our resources, this series is about you. It's for you to get you and the important people in your lives to a healthy place where money is concerned. Now in his materials, Ron Blue uses an iceberg diagram. There it is. Um, this is Tim's drawing from last week, and I'm not any better artist, so I just decided to use his, and I can't remember, I think it was a kumquat or a squa butternut squash, is that what it was? A butternut squash. It looks more like that than an iceberg, but it still, it still serves its purpose, so thanks, Tim, for the, for the illustration. Anyway, what you're seeing here is this iceberg, and above the water are our habits our spending, our saving, our giving, the things that maybe people notice about us. But what we're focused on is what lies beneath, what's beneath the waterline, what's happening below the surface. And those are the characteristics of our heart. Stewardship, wisdom, contentment, and faith. Those are at the core of why we might be in a mess financially. Because for many of us, our hearts are in the wrong place. Tim talked about one of these areas that are below the surface last week, the area of stewardship, the concept that God owns it all. Everything we have comes from him. It's a gift. And we, as his people, are to steward those gifts well. And today, we're going to be really focusing in on the area of contentment. And I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I, I've never done this before, but when I found out that I was, had the privilege of speaking during this series, I actually asked for the topic of contentment. And that's because I resonate so deeply with this topic. This topic is a struggle for me personally. And it is something that God has been teaching me and humbling me in over many, many years, very consistently and very constantly. So I wanted to talk about something that I struggle with deeply and hear what God had to say to me and then share that with you. So being content is in the dictionary says satisfaction, ease of mind, that word, that phrase ease of mind sounds wonderful. Many of you are thinking, how do I get there, especially where my finances are concerned? I want to be in a state of peaceful happiness. But that's difficult when we live in a greedy culture, isn't it? The American culture is very, very greedy, and it's so easy to fall into that trap. And let me be clear. Greed doesn't know socioeconomic status. It doesn't matter how much you have, how little you have, what you're able to do, what you're not able to do, how rich or poor you are. Greed is a state of your heart. And greed isn't something that we like to talk about. You know, it's one of the sins that we don't really want to put out there. I've heard people talk a lot about a lot of issues in their lives, but very rarely do I hear someone saying, you know what, I really, I just spend too much money on myself. I'm, I'm pretty greedy. I, I actually lust after money and things and it's destroying my life. You just don't hear people talk about it very much. And it's something that's so easy to keep hidden. Nobody has to know that you have an online shopping addiction Nobody knows if you can actually make your mortgage payment or not. These are all things that you can keep hidden from everybody around you. Greed and debt are, are outward expressions of the deeper heart issue of contentment. The underlying core issue is 
we're not living in contentment or our contentment is very, very misplaced. And many of us, no matter how much we make or how much we have or how much we do, still live lives of discontent. I'm gonna ask you a series of questions because some of you in the room may be like, I, I'm not sure that I am discontent. Maybe I, I feel pretty good. Well, I'm gonna ask you some questions and I really want you to give these questions some thought and then gauge where you are in this whole spectrum of contentment, okay? Are you satisfied with how much you make right this minute? In this moment, are you satisfied with your income, your salary right now? Are you satisfied with what you have right at this moment, exactly as it is, your home, your car or cars, your clothes, shoes, food? Are you satisfied exactly as they are right in this moment? Are you satisfied with what you do for fun? Vacations, if you get to take them, are you happy with them? Do you like where you go, how you get there, how long you stay? You're good with all of that. Do you see what other people make, have, or do and wish that you were in their place? Do you believe if you just made this much more money, had this much more stuff, or could do this many more things that you would be truly content? Do you believe that enough will ever truly be enough? Can you picture a time when you will truly be satisfied with your life just as it is, nothing more? Think about those questions for a moment and then gauge where am I on the spectrum of being content? Because as I read those questions, I feel convicted. I find myself often dissatisfied and discontent, longing for just a little bit more. And we live in the land of more, don't we? We live in the land of more. Most of us here live in a land where everybody has more than the next person. I often try to tell my kids, we live in fantasy world. This isn't real life. And I've worked hard to try to make them see the bigger picture and expose them to the hard because it's this crazy bubble world. And now we don't have to just look out our window. We can see it everywhere because of the beauty of social media, and there's good things about social media, I'm not bashing it, I use it. But because of it, we can watch the best of everyone's lives play out before us. That can certainly add to our discontent. It's hard to be content and satisfied when it appears everyone around us has so much more and is doing so much more, and they're all so happy about it. Nobody po posts the hard stuff. Like on the way to dinner, we argued for an hour trying to find a place to eat. We sat down in one place and left because we thought it was too expensive. By the time we got to dinner, nobody was happy with anybody else, but we smiled quickly. And everybody on social media thought it was a, just a beautiful night. I do it all the time. If I told you the story behind all my pictures, you guys would be shocked. Social media makes our attitudes ripe and ready for discontent. My husband and I had a, a conversation about this on the wee, in the wee hours of the morning. It was about 5 a.m. and we had taken a little trip with our family of our four kids and us uh, down to Florida. Um, just a quick trip uh, before my son started his freshman year in college and my daughter went into her senior year. And uh, we were driving along and we'd driven for well, if I'm gonna be honest, Jeff had driven for 16 hours. I did not drive once. Um, I know, I know, it's a problem. Anyway, um, 
So we had just dropped Liza off in Nashville. She was gonna visit a few friends before she went back to school. And we were driving wee hours of the morning. The other three are asleep in the back. And if you know my kids, Will and Annie have long legs. So someone's foot was in my face and they'd been arguing about who was getting the back seat. And you know, it was, it was what it was. So as we're driving along, I turned to Jeff and I said, do you think they're even grateful? Do you think they even appreciate this time that we had away? Because they can look at their friends and their friends had better vacations and they got to fly and they were gone for two weeks and stayed in a fancier place and went to a better location. And, and I realized I was putting that on my kids when really it was probably me that wasn't totally grateful or appreciative in that moment. And the problem wasn't with, with anyone else. It wasn't their problem. The problem was with me. What was going on in my heart below the surface. And when we don't deal with what's below the surface, it manifests itself in ugly ways above the surface. Looking for ways and things to fill that dissatisfaction spending more money, buying more things, going into debt or more debt, having nothing left over to save or to give. Because we believe, we believe the lie that if we change our circumstances, we'll find contentment. And that is not true. And I had the Holy Spirit speak to me about that years ago. I told you he's been working on me for a long time. I was taking a walk around our neighborhood. We lived down south of Castleton in a little Cape Cod home. It was our first home. Liza was a baby. So this was like 20 years ago. And I was strolling her around the neighborhood and I kept thinking to myself, oh, I don't like our neighborhood and I wish I had a nicer house. And we have well water. Some of you may love well water. I wanted city water so bad, I hated the well water. So I was like, if I just had city water, I'd be so much happier. Yeah, I know it's ridiculous, but I did think it in that moment. Um, if I just lived closer to family, mind you, we were 20 minutes away from family, but I was like, if I could just be a little closer and closer to my job, and I was just complaining and whining, and in that moment, the Holy Spirit said to me, your circumstances will never make you happy. Stop thinking that you can change the circumstances around you, and that's going to bring you joy and contentment. You will not find it there. He who is not contented with what he has would not be contented with what he would like to have. He said in that moment, your heart needs to change, Amy, not your circumstances. Contentment is an attitude of the heart, a mindset, a disposition. So how do we find it? How do we change our hearts? Two words. Faith and trust. You must have faith that God is enough and trust that he will provide exactly what you need. True contentment comes from accepting Christ and having faith that in him you will have everything you need. He is enough and his promises are enough. Turn with me, page 985 in your Bible, to Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. You'll find it on your house, in your house Bibles, page 985, or you can look on the app. The scripture's also in there. But we're looking at Philippians 4, 11 through 13. This is a, a letter that the apostle Paul, Paul was writing to the Philippian church. Okay, so we're going to start chapter 4, Philippians verse 11. I am not saying this because I am, need, I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The background to this scripture is that Paul is in prison at the time he wrote this, possibly facing execution over false charges against him. And in this letter, Paul is thanking the Philippian church for sending him a financial gift. But he wants to make sure that they understand that he was content before that gift came. 
He appreciates their kindness and generosity, but he is also teaching them that God is sufficient all the time. He was for Paul before the gift, and he will be for Paul after. Paul knew what it was to be in need, to be in difficult circumstances, even being in prison. He had been all over the place. He'd been hungry, but he'd also been well-fed. Through it all, he had learned that being content comes from knowing at the deepest level that God is enough. And he is present in all circumstances. The Bible calls us to allow our convictions, not our circumstances, to govern our sense of contentment. True biblical contentment is a conviction that Christ's power, purpose, and provision is sufficient for every circumstance. We need to learn to walk through all kinds of adversity, believing in and experiencing Christ's sufficiency. We have to choose to rest on God's good promises despite what may be going on in our lives. Your heart needs to change not your circumstances. Flip over now to page 1018, Hebrews 13, five in your Bibles, or you can find it on your app, and actually this one's even gonna be on the screen. Hebrews 13, five, page 1018. And this starts out very strong, a commandment. Hebrews 13, five, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have, for God has said, I will never fail you, I will never abandon you. Starts out with a commandment, don't love money. Simple, don't make money, don't make things your idol. No one, you see, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money directly from the mouth of Jesus. There is not room in your heart to love God and to love money. You have to choose one. There is not room for both. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. More words from Jesus. What you treasure is where your heart will follow. Do you treasure God or do you treasure money? Because you cannot treasure both. There is not room for that. And just like Paul, the writer of Hebrews is saying, whether you have it all or you have nothing, be happy with what you have. Trust that God knows what's best for you. It is from God and God promises he will never fail you. He will never abandon you. He will give you what you need. He will be there when he's hard. He does not promise financial prosperity or that it's gonna be easy, but he does promise that he will be there with us. And if we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, great contentment should come from those promises. You must have faith that God is enough and trust that he will provide exactly what you need. Many of the people in my life don't have a lot from the world's standards. They don't have tons of money or material things, but they're some of the most content and joy-filled people I've ever met because they fully embrace these two truths. Maggie, my seventh grader, is working on a family history project. So she was asking me questions about my family, and we started talking about my great-grandfather. His name was Jesse Thornton, and he was a missionary for many years, but he finished up his life as the pastor of a a church in St. Louis, Missouri. And he was a pastor there for many years. And I remember my grandmother telling me the story that uh, my great-grandfather never took a salary from that church. They would receive the offering each week and he would pay out the bills and pay whatever staff needed to be paid and he would take whatever was left over every week. And I remember her telling me as his daughter that they never were wanting for anything. They always had exactly what they needed. And he always believed that God was sufficient. And this happened many years, they found out later, many years later, that uh, the treasurer of the church was taking money out of the offering for himself every single week. 
And yet my grandfather still had exactly what he needed because God provided for him and he stood strong on the two truths that God is enough and he will provide exactly what we need. And finally in Job it says, Job 36, 11, if they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. You can find contentment when you obey and serve Christ. I am the most content when I am doing what God has called me to do. I am the most content when I am sharing life with the people God has given me. And I am overly content when both of those worlds come together, doing the work that God has created me to do and doing it with the people that he has given me to do it with. That's why we believe at Grace that you were made for more, that we all have a destiny designed for us by God himself. And I believe you will find amazing contentment when you discover that. You must have faith that God is enough, enough and trust that he will provide for you. And it is a spiritual practice. It is something you have to choose day after day after day. It's a decision you have to make. And if you keep committing to that, as with any spiritual discipline, the Holy Spirit will open your heart to it in ways that you can't even imagine. But I do want you to hear me on this. I am not saying that we can never buy anything again. I am not saying that you can never go on vacation. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying, where is your heart? And maybe think about it before you do. Is it because you aren't satisfied with what you have at the moment? Is it filling something in you that only Jesus truly can? Is it going to put you in debt or deeper in debt? What does enough look like for you? Do you need it right now? Maybe it's time to actually not get more, but simplify your life. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Are you intentional with your decisions, purposeful with your purchases, thoughtful with your planning? Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content, ease of mind, state of peaceful happiness. And if you need help with any of these issues, we're providing all of these opportunities at Grace. Let me highlight them for you. The peer-to-peer -peer financial counseling this is where somebody that has gotten this uh, together, they've got some financial wisdom and they want to sit with you. It is, it is completely confidential and they will sit with you and your family or whoever and help you one-on-one -on -one counseling. We have a financial planning uh, ministry seminar coming up at uh, this campus on October 5th at 10 o'clock at this campus. If you can't make that, at one o'clock at our Fishers campus. And we're partnering with financial planning ministries to offer you this at no cost, helping you get your will together, estate planning, trust. This is an amazing opportunity that we are offering. The Generous Destiny Workshop, coming Saturday, October 26th. Um, this is learning how to maximize the impact of your giving. Um, three men are going to be leading this. Greg, Greg James, president of the National Christian Foundation. Lane Hokema, private wealth advisor for the Ronald Blue Trust. And Brent Dunn, senior advisor and owner of Crosspoint Wealth Advisors. Great men with great thoughts and great advice for you on these areas. My husband actually knows and has worked with a couple of these guys and he said it is tremendous. This is a tremendous opportunity. And then our life group curriculum, God owns it all, a six week curriculum that life groups can go through to understand financial management as part of discipleship. All of these opportunities are offered to you at no cost. You just go to our website, gracechurch.us, The Good Life, to find out more information, and we can answer questions out in the lobby as well. You must have faith that God is enough and trust that he will provide what you need. We want you to live the good life in every way. We want you to find true, beautiful peace and that ease of mind that comes with a content life, a life of faith that God is enough and trust that he will provide what you need. Do you believe he will take care of you? Because he will, and he has. 
Look back at what he's already done. Is Jesus enough for you? Because he is enough. No matter where you are in life, emotionally, mentally, relationally, physically, and even financially, Jesus is enough. He truly is all that we need. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. You'll also find service times and locations for all three of our Grace Church campuses. We would love for you to join us. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.